is there's got to be a better solution. He likes to tinker. He's not afraid to tinker. He likes to fix, to rethink, to reconfigure uh, for art. This is the thing that I think characterizes it for me. Nothing is ever perfect. He doesn't subscribe to the saying, the perfect is the enemy of the good. For art, the perfect is the antagonist of the good. The good can always be more perfect. So like many of Colin Rowe's wisest students who learned his lessons, art's ambivalently utopian, but he's never doctrinaire. Everything could be better. Everything could be rethought. Everything is subject to the intelligent application of design thinking. So this is true, I think, of his work as a practitioner, his approach to teaching, his achievements as an administrator, and personally, the last item, administrator, I owe a great debt to Art, or at least admiration to Art, for his persistence in redesigning the MR program some 15 years ago. His everything could be better attitude and his compulsion to tinker and to redesign really launched the independent and intellectually ambitious MR program that we have now. That's my belief. So it's a great pleasure to introduce you. Uh, I think your commitment to architecture, design, and especially to school has been absolutely persistent, never ending. For art, for art I think. This is the credo I would like to always associate with them. If something will never be perfect, it'll also never be good enough. And that's what I think when I look at your work. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, here I am, the imperfect man. <laughs> uh, I'm told that every night I come home. Um, Thank you, Mark. And I really have to thank uh, Dean Speaks and so many people that worked on this exhibition, Jonathan Louis and uh, Benjamin Farnsworth for the catalog or the little pamphlet, and all the students. Uh, but anyway, I, I think I said all that at the opening. Um, what to say about this? You know, I prepared this little talk for, for more students. Now I see a lot of faculty piss, oh, I gotta readjust, this has gotta be better, smarter. Um, the whole point of this show, and I started out talking to Michael Speaks about it, was that I wanted to do something that was, you know, not about all my professional work, but something that was clear, uh, a lesson, a kind of didactic show to, to instruct in a way um, a proposition about production, architectural production. And, you know, we all know that the house has been an icon for experimentation uh, by architects from Palladio to Eisenman and everybody in between. So I thought taking these two houses, one of them done some time ago and another one, well, some time ago also, but uh, not as long as that, and to talk about two ways of approaching these projects. Um, one is about the wall, which is a device that separates, and I, I, here I, I'm going into my student mode, you know, the faculty know all this. Um, it, you know, defines space, it separates, divides, frames, can be thick, thin, so many things are inherent in that, that element. And the other is really about a mapping or, you know, uh, a, a plan that's horizontal. So one's kind of vertical, one's horizontal. And what I'm looking for within the discipline of architecture, something that is generic, typological, um, that at least is the basis for my study of architecture. It's the way I study it. So I look for work, not all work, but I look for work that involves these two, one a device and one a kind of, one an element and one a device. And, and see throughout history and more recent work how architects have deployed these, this methodology. And uh, I find it the, the, it's kind of a template for studying architecture. It's limiting, yes, but I have found 
Uh, a few of us might relate to this. Life is pretty short. You gotta go, go quickly to get one or two good ideas, maybe one good idea, is all you might have. I hate to say that to all you young people who are looking for a dozen good ideas. Hopefully you get them. But that, that, that one idea about, these, about the study of architecture through this template of the element and the device um, enables a kind of focus for me and a focus for the work. Now, I've been really fortunate uh, having clients, uh, a couple of them on the iPads as well, that were really open to anything I wanted to do within reason, that being budget, site, program, and so forth, the reality of, of building these buildings. Uh, but they were open to this theoretical uh, approach in a way, a mode of operation. Now, the generic type you'll see in the diagrams and so forth, there's a transformation that occurs obviously through, and this is not a new theme, you know, the ideal and the circumstantial, but the environment, materials, budget, program, all those things begin to impinge on this generic diagram and it changes, we know that. And I was hoping that the students would see the diagram, see the early sketches, and see how the whole process works out. And it was Michael Speaks, our dean, who said, look, can you put some construction drawings in there too? I'd like to see them. And he's not an architect. And I said, really? You want to see construction drawings with numbers and dimension lines? And he said, yeah, 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 let's get that in there. So hence, you'll see some of the documents. Uh, all hand-drawn before we went to Revit, these projects <laughs> existed. So anyway, it's kind of fun to, to look at them again. It's nostalgic. But I think the, the, the idea is to see from the early sketches all the way through and these diagrams here on what the transformation was. And then finally, you know, there are the tape, uh, coffee table versions of the photographs and so forth that are kind of elaborate, but it's part of an exhibition, I think. So I, I think the most important thing for the students is to see what the diagram is about and try and understand, well, what was he trying to do and what was this lens like that he was using for, for the element and the device. Um, now, I certainly don't put this, these two houses in any category with, you know, I was thinking of the houses that we all know, the villa, uh, uh, at Poissy by Le Corbusier, Falling Water, Farnsworth Meese, Venturi's Mother's House, the Dimaxium House, Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, the Villa Rotunda, the Villa uh, Capriti by Monte. I mean, those, that, that's, those, are, those are the giants. And it reminds me that um, when Isaac Newton got the, the British gold medal for mathematics back in the 18th century, he, uh, he said something like this, that uh, if I could not have achieved the, uh, couldn't, couldn't have made the achievements in mathematics if I didn't stand on the shoulders of the giants that preceded me. So in other words, I think we, we're studying architecture by looking at what's been done before with a critical eye. And of course, there's a, there's a problem with precedent, and we know what that is. I think it's the narrative for the projects beyond the diagram are really something that are both cultural, environmental, the issues of today, the contemporary society problems, issues that you're concerned with. And they have to be brought into this. And that's going to challenge your study of the precedent. Because if it's just a formal game, OK, that's within the discipline of architecture. But if you're going to build it, then you're dealing with something, not the zeitgeist of, of everything at the moment, but something that is both um, generic, common, and something that's unique and present. And that's really a struggle uh, in producing architecture, I think. Especially in the houses, because you, you know, on one hand, you're given a license to do something, as I said. On the other hand, you're responsible for um, the lifestyle of the people to act out their everyday lives in this theater that you've made for them. So um, I think that's where the narrative for the project is so important. 
that, uh, yeah, and I think it's the application uh, of the generic types in the formal organization and the conceptual narrative which represents these empirical conditions, I'm reading now, uh, that I think are the, the interesting part of doing this. So it, I don't want the students to think that it's just about making diagrams and kind of moving squares around or walls around. It's not about that at all. It's a very highly you know, crafted and intellectual process that you have to go through in order to do that. And it's not just, it, so where does the information come from? It comes from everyday life as you observe it. But, it ha but the, the template of, these, of the element and the, and the device are for me at least the starting point. Because design is not done through balloon diagrams, moving spaces around to make some efficient arrangement functionally for a building. That's not architecture. That's just building. So what makes it architecture? Uh, not that I say that this is. But that's been my patient search to find out what it is and how do you produce it. And I find I can study it more. I don't know if I can produce it as well as I can understand it through study. So I, I, I think that without going through all of the buildings, you can certainly do that. I think that's the, the rationale for the, for the exhibition. And hopefully, it's a little lesson plan. And I had a. a, a a wonderful email from uh, Gerard Demiani, former student of ours back in the 80s, a very successful architect and educator in Pittsburgh, Carnegie. And he said at the, law, at the end of the email, he said, well, giving a lesson even to the end. <laughs> and I hope that's what the students uh, get out of it. Um, so I think that's about it on any questions or Anybody have a, why did you do it and how did you do it? <laughs> but thanks for coming. I really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the show.